Um, thank you for uh, the introduction, Warren, and, and thank you to the organization for uh, nominating me for this uh, honor. Uh, I've had a great time so far giving the lecture uh, all around the world. I've been down to uh, Australia, around North America. I'll be going to Europe later on. This has been a terrific opportunity to uh, meet a wide variety of hydrogeologists around the, around the world. The talk I want to give today starts with the concept of intrinsic bioremediation. We all like this concept. The, the potentially responsible parties particularly like this idea of intrinsic bioremediation because we can clean up the aquifer without actually having to do anything. And it certainly is a very cost-effective approach. Now, we used to call this the no-action option back in the old days, and that wasn't a very saleable term. So we've come up with this term, intrinsic bioremediation or natural attenuation or whatever other term we apply to it. But what we're hoping is that native microorganisms will consume the contaminated hydrocarbon and get rid of the problem. Well, the difficulty is, is that the carbon doesn't just magically disappear. When microorganisms use contaminating hydrocarbon as a source of food, it initiates a complex sequence of geochemical reactions that completely changes the nature of the aquifer. And so that's what I want to talk about today is sort of the other side of the page of intrinsic bioremediation. What else happens as your target compounds are hopefully disappearing? So I first want to give uh, a lot of credit to other people um, who have helped me uh, over the years in my research uh, on this topic. I've uh, been working closely with the U.S. Geological Survey and their research project up in the, uh, up at Bemidji, Minnesota, and a whole list of people who have contributed, and I particularly want to call attention to these two at the top, Franz Hebert and Wanju Choi, are two of my graduate students who have put in a lot of time and effort for very little money to help out on this. First, the conclusions. Yes, in fact, microorganisms can efficiently degrade hydrocarbons in particular. Chlorinated hydrocarbons, not so well, but fuel hydrocarbons, they can degrade it very efficiently. But in the process, they generate or produce reactive byproducts, product byproducts that react with the geology of the system. Microbial metabolic reactions, in fact, can completely dominate the geochemistry of the aquifer rapidly dissolving and precipitating minerals. As the minerals dissolve, the microorganism gains access to essential trace nutrients, such as phosphorus and iron. So there's a two-way street. The microorganisms affect the geology, and the geology affects the microorganism. In the end, you have to put aside what you learned in school about equilibrium geochemistry because it has nothing to do with how soluble the mineral is. And it has everything to do about where the microbe is colonizing. I'll give you an example in this talk of where the Goldish weathering sequence is completely reversed. And olivine is stable, and microcline dissolves, because it's not the equilibrium geochemistry, it's all the microbial geochemistry. So there's kind of two approaches to, to look at this idea of uh, geochemical ecology. As far as I know, I think we actually made this term up, geochemical ecology. But there's, sort of, there's the geochemist point of view, and then there's the microbial ecologist point of view. The geochemist point of view, the, uh, you know, I'm a geochemist. We tend to kind of focus on all the uh, inorganic chemistry, the mineral reactants, the carbon sources, all the uh, thermodynamic gobbledygook and redox and kinetics and all that other good stuff. And then we look at the changes in the solutes in the system changes in the phases that might be precipitating. And well, you know, we recognize the bugs probably did it. That's not terribly important. What's really important is all that great chemistry stuff that's going on. And so when a geochemist looks at a reaction along a flow path, it could be a contaminant flow path or some other flow path, they look at uh, some down gradient discharge point and some up gradient recharge point <coughs> and look at the changes in these types of constituents and then fill in the blank, all the reactions that might be going on, dissolution, precipitation, et cetera. Well, you know, the bugs probably are doing it, but that's not terribly important. Now, a microbial ecologist has a little bit different viewpoint on life, if you will. A microbial ecologist is terribly concerned about the cell and not terribly concerned about anything else. Now, the cell needs something from outside. It needs some uh, nutrients 
It needs substrate. And when I talk about substrate today, I mean carbon substrate, hydrocarbon, or some other source of food. And terminal electron acceptors, or TEAs, we'll get into that a little bit later. And the cell does, in fact, perturb the environment. It puts out byproducts and cell mass. But to a microbial person, it's what's going on inside the cell. It's really, really interesting. All the enzymatic pathways and ATP and energy and all that kind of good stuff. Now, you know, the cell is perturbing, is, is perturbing its environment, but it's not terribly important what's going on as long as the cell survives. And so a microbial ecologist will look at reactions along a flow path in terms of substrate. The substrate is introduced, a contaminant hits the groundwater, it's taken up, the enzymes are produced, metabolism, perhaps cell growth, until finally the substrate is depleted. And anything else that's going on is not terribly important as long as the cell survives. Now, about a year or so after we had published some of our early work uh, on this subject, my office neighbor came across the hall and laid a copy of Discover Magazine down on my desk and said, you're famous, Phil. And I started reading it. It was the regular cartoon series that, at the back of uh, Discover by a guy named Larry Gonick. Yeah, Sticks and Stones is the name of the cartoon series. It's a whole two-page cartoon. And I started reading it, and I thought, oh, that's pretty, pretty cute. He's talking about our research, you know, bugs eating rocks, all the rest of that. Our grant runs out in three years. And actually, we had a grant that was going to run out in three years. And then I got to the part where they named us, Franz Hebert and Phil Bennett, University of Texas. Then it got pretty funny uh, until it, well, it was brought up by my department as to whether this should be included in my tenure package. <laughs> right? It's, it's international recognition, right? <laughs> kind of peculiar, but at any rate, uh, this guy was uh, rather um, insightful about my research, if, if humorous. And so uh, the cartoon characters will sort of appear in the, uh, throughout the talk. And in case anybody's wondering which one of us is which, I'm the good-looking one. I want to compare two sites. I want to compare, um, first, a contaminated site uh, near Bemidji, Minnesota that was contaminated with crude petroleum. And this has been the focus of research of one, of the, uh, one part of the US Geological Survey's toxic hydrology program. And then I'm going to compare that briefly with an uncontaminated but organic-rich site that's only about 100 kilometers away and compare some of the uh, reactions that we see. The Bemidji site was contaminated in 1979 when a high-pressure oil pipeline burst. The pipeline runs approximately along this trend here. The pipeline burst here, sprayed out petroleum on the land surface. A pool of petroleum accumulated here, and then petroleum ran down the topography, and a second pool of oil accumulated here. At this site, groundwater moves from lower left to upper right along the little flying arrow there and discharges at this small lake. And uh, this is a cross-section here uh, along this transect AA prime that will appear in later graphs, and you can use that to orient yourself. Also, in later graphs, this uh, railroad will appear, and you can use that for orientation as well. Now, this particular aquifer is a shallow glacial sand and gravel aquifer. There's very little surface runoff, and all the lakes are generally flow-through groundwater lakes. A quick site summary. After cleanup, such as it was, there was still about 400,000 liters of a light aliphatic crude floating on the water table in that one north pool of oil. After nine years, the free product had only moved a, a few tens of meters, about 30 meters down gradient. The oil itself is moving quite slowly. The contaminant plume, and I define for, for the present contaminant as being dissolved organic carbon compounds, the contaminant plume has moved much further, of course, groundwater moving much faster than the oil. And dissolved carbon has moved about 200 meters down gradient. Now, the, the plume has reached approximate steady state. And what I mean by that is that the, it appears as though the rate of dissolution of new oil components is about equal to the rate of biodegradation over this 200 meter distance. And so the plume, this contaminant plume, doesn't seem to be extending very far, at least the carbon part. The inorganic constituents, byproducts of reactions, have moved much, much further. But the organic plume seems to be pretty much stabilized. Now, I think that, this, that you've all probably run into this. Hydrocarbon fuel spills tend to stabilize, with one odd exception, benzene. And if you have a very anaerobic 
uh, contaminant plume, benzene often travels much further than you expect it. But overall, I think hydrocarbon plumes tend to, tend to come to a steady state. Under the oil, the dissolved organic carbon, that stuff that we're, we're bringing up and measuring, is only about 8% BTEX compounds. It's about 20% uh, methane, and methanogenesis is an important de degradation pathway uh, f at this particular site. But most of the organic carbon is actually as non-volatile organic acids, partially degraded byproducts from the original petroleum. It's these compounds, these organic acids, that are reacting with the geology. So a quick orientation to the site, just to give you an idea of what's going on. Uh, this is a, a vertical uh, cross-section here of the uh, saturated zone, horizontal cutaway at the water table, a vertical cross-section of the Vado zone, and then, of course, the land surface. And in case anybody wants to point this out later, I don't believe there are seagulls actually in Minnesota, but it's the only bird I know how to draw. The, uh, the water table is about 10 meters below land surface. Um, mixed sand and gravel, gravel and sand, you know, your typical homogeneous isotropic aquifer. The, uh, the pool of oil is moving slowly down gradient. Here, groundwater is moving from left to right, and it's moving as fingers. You, you've probably run into this before. It doesn't move as a solid front of oil. It has these fingers of oil that will go out and come back according to change in the water table elevation. Uh, throughout this, this talk, however, I will be uh, referring to a particular flow path, and I'll be talking about the changes in chemistry along that flow path. The flow path that I'll be using will start up gradient here at the water table, will move through the area that is contaminated by the surface sprayed petroleum, then it's that path that moves directly under the oil and then down gradient, and it actually sinks a little bit down here as it continues down gradient, it's, it's being pushed down by recharge pressure. So that's the flow path that I'll be referring to. A biogeochemical summary. The aquifer materials is a uh, mostly quartz, about 60% quartz, 30% mixed feldspars, about half and half plage and uh, potassium feldspar. It's about 5% carbonates, again about half and half calcite and dolomite. There's very little clay in this aquifer. There's a lot of silt-sized material, but there's nothing that's actually, very little that's actually clay. But as I'll point out later, this is changing because the, as the bugs create clays uh, while they're dissolving feldspars. It's a typical groundwater for this area. Calcium bicarbonate type groundwater, uh, oxidizing conditions, very little dissolved iron, <coughs> uh, uh, dissolved silica is about 18 milligram per liter. It's about 2 ppm dissolved organic carbon. The viable culturable organisms, and that's a very specific term, the viable culturable organisms, those organisms that we can actually count, uh, is typical of a, what I would call an oligotrophic aquifer, the kind of aquifer that doesn't have a lot of nutrients, doesn't have a lot of carbon, so it doesn't have a lot of viable organisms. It's about 10 to the fifth per gram of soil and about 100 per mill of water. And this is typical of a clean aquifer. Um, and uh, not so typical of, a, of an engineering uh, sewage treatment plant, which would have much, much higher abundance. In the contaminated groundwater, the groundwater uh, oxygen, nitrate, sulfate have all disappeared. They've all been utilized by the microorganisms as electron acceptors. Dissolved organic carbon has increased to about 70 milligram per liter. Again, most of that is actually as, as organic acids, partially degraded byproducts of the oil. Dissolved iron increases to 50 to 55 milligram per liter in the groundwater, what we can sample out of a well. And uh, in some work that Isabel Cazzarelli at the US Geological Survey has been doing, she's been looking at the poor waters in the core, and she's gotten as high as 80 or 85 milligram per liter of dissolved iron. Dissolved silica increases to 70 milligram per liter. There's been a, a number of surveys of microorganisms, and they kind of, it's hard to compare them. They change their approach. But an early survey was done by Fushan Chang at Bemidji State University. He found what are typically considered aerobes. And this is a typical rogues gallery of microorganisms that you might find in any fuel contaminant aquifer, fuel contaminated aquifer. Uh, but in the early days of the plume, the uh, microbial consortium mostly consisted of aerobes. 
as time has gone on, the, the plume nature has changed. It's become increasingly reduced. And now, in the most latest survey that was done by uh, Mike Godsey and Barbara Beacons of the U.S. Geological Survey in Menlo Park, uh, they found it's be the, the consortia is now dominated by the iron reducers, fermenters, and methanogens. What's interesting is that the abundance has not increased. It's still about 10 to the fifth per gram of soil and maybe 100 or actually less per mill of water. And sometimes we'll collect a mill of water or we'll collect a water sample. We can't find any microorganisms in it at all. There's a lot of carbon substrate there. There's a lot of food for the microorganisms, but they're not adding cell mass. And I think this is typical of contaminated uh, aquifers. We want the intrinsic bioremediation to work. We've got all kinds of carbon substrate. They're perfectly capable of degrading it, but they, they're not growing. They're not adding biomass. And so it's still about the same amount. The problem here in this aquifer is that it's nutrient limited. There's no phosphorus. There's no detectable phosphorus. And uh, after the first few meters, there's no detectable nitrogen. So let me give you uh, a picture of what I mean by geochemical ecology. And I'll start out with your uh, typical PowerPoint microbe. And use here petroleum hydrocarbon as a substrate. And from that petroleum hydrocarbon, we're going to produce carbon dioxide and hopefully cell mass, although at, at the Bemidji site, very little cell mass has been produced. What a microorganism wants to do is it wants to move electrons. It wants to move electrons from the source of electrons, the carbon substrate, to a sink for electrons, one of these terminal electron acceptors, oxygen, nitrate, sulfate, ferric iron. By moving electrons, it gains energy. It gains energy for metabolic processes, and it gains energy for eventual cell division. But in the process, it creates these reduced byproducts and, of course, the carbon dioxide that we've already mentioned. Now, up to this point, this is the microbial ecologist view. But this microorganism is not in a petri dish. This microorganism is sitting on a geologic surface, a mineral. And so it's interacting with that mineral surface. In, in addition to all of these things that it's producing, it's producing these organic acids that we've already mentioned. These organic acids are an interesting uh, group of compounds. Uh, we might call them ligands. And what I mean by a ligand is an organic compound, organic acid that can grab metals, chelate metals, um, and uh, move them around. Sometimes these ligands are produced for a biologic purpose, if a microorganism could have a purpose. Uh, these ligands, for instance, siderophores, are produced to mobilize iron. And it will reach out and selectively grab ferric iron for use by the microorganism. The ligands could be the terminal point of that um, type of microorganism. Fermenters, for example, will produce organic acids. That's what they're intending to do. Um, and then finally, they can just be accidental byproducts, extracellular enzymes, partially degraded byproducts, uh, cell material, whatever else. All of these things can react with geologic surfaces, particularly the siderophores. They will, yes, chelate iron, but in addition, they'll chelate aluminum and silicon, those elements that make up the basic framework uh, feldspars in this aquifer. So they're producing things that will dissolve the aquifer itself. In addition, the microorganism produces something that some people call glycocalyx, and the microbial people will call this exopolysaccharide, or EPS. Uh, the microbial ecologists also have, I think, a much better term for it. They call it slime, which I think is quite descriptive. And uh, the microorganisms use, uh, in this case, probably use the slime to attach themselves to this mineral surface. And we'll some of the uh, uh, micrographs later on, how they attach on that way. Now, these constituents, these things, will react with this mineral surface and dissolve it, perhaps, and in the process release all the trace constituents in that mineral. What I've been finding is that the minerals that are colonized and the minerals that are dissolving are the minerals that have trace nutrients in them. And you can put, you can compare two, two minerals that are essentially identical, one that has trace phosphorus and one that doesn't. The one that has trace phosphorus is colonized. The one that doesn't have any phosphorus is left alone. So there's, there's that link between the geology and the microbiology. You're not going to get away without some contour plots. Of course, any geochemist has to put some of these up here. It's gratuitous. Um, 
This is a, a contour plot of dissolved organic carbon. Here's that transect, AA prime. Groundwater is moving from lower left to upper right. The, uh, uh, this is that pool of oil. And the dissolved organic carbon uh, concentration reaches about 55 ppm of the non-methane carbon. Again, most of that is actually organic acids. And then there's a plume that goes down gradient. And you can see that that plume of organic carbon, ha this is uh, the scale here is in meters, it doesn't actually go very far. It attenuates really quite rapidly. Here is a cross-section plot, groundwater moving from left to right. This is that transect A to A prime. <coughs> Concentration in milligram per liter here, and then dissolved oxygen is over here. Several constituents on here, but let's just pick on oxygen. Oxygen here in the orange, very high in the background groundwater decreases underneath the oil, essentially zero under the oil, completely anaerobic conditions, and then it increases as you exit out from under the oil, as recharge and diffusion brings fresh oxygen to the system. And all these things, the sulfate, the nitrate, everything goes to zero under the oil. And in that very anaerobic part of the plume, the uh, methanogenesis is occurring, and so we get fairly high concentrations of methane, and then that decreases out the backside. So we can get an initial idea of this plume just by looking at redox. And we can look at it from two perspectives. We can look at it from the microbial perspective and the geochemical perspective. Now, this is a diagram that uh, Mary Jo Baedeker produced, or, uh, made for her Darcy lecture back in 1994. Uh, and it uh, still has a lot of use uh, for my lecture now. Uh, let's look at this from the geochemist's point of view. So we would say that groundwater here moving from left to right Groundwater that is oxygenated, aerobic water, moves through the area where there is Vado zone contamination of groundwater. Oxygen starts to decrease a little bit. Then oxygen, uh, we get to microaerophilic conditions here. Oxygen is, is low. Nitrate and sulfate are disappearing. In the very anoxic part of the plume, nitrate, sulfate, oxygen are all gone. Uh, dissolved uh, iron is increasing substantially. Methanogenesis is occurring. Uh, and then as we go out the back end, that whole sequence is reversed. Now let's look at it from the microbial ecologist's point of view. Microbial ecologists will look at the same picture. And they can say, well, in this area, aerobic bacteria, heterotrophs, aerobes, are dominating the system, consuming oxygen and carbon, producing uh, carbon dioxide. Here, the faculty of anaerobes are dominant, the nitrate reducers, the sulfate reducers, uh, some, some of the fermenters, and they're uh, consuming the last of the electron acceptors and uh, producing organic acids and bicarbonate. Uh, in here, in the very anoxic part, the obligate anaerobes are dominant. The iron reducers, the uh, methanogens, uh, also linked in there are the fermenters. And then out the back end, the whole system reverses. So we can get this, or two views of the same bit of data. I only have two of these kind of graphs here, so. Um, I want to give you a little bit of an idea of what happens with, uh, as the oil is being uh, consumed, not to get into the whole enzyme pathway thing, but actually to see what the byproducts are. Sometimes a hydrocarbon spill will, will stay aerobic, and we can get aerobic metabolism occurring where the microorganism, and here I'm going to use benzene as the model hydrocarbon, will use oxygen and oxygenase or dioxygenase enzymes to produce an intermediate byproduct, catechol. And then that catechol is cleaved to form a complex organic acid. And eventually, it produces carbon dioxide. Now, in this scenario, benzene is very rapidly degraded. Toluene, xylene, ethyl benzene are going to be a little bit slower. We're going to produce a little bit of catechol, not a lot. We're going to produce some organic acids, but we'll produce a lot of CO2. Now, this organic acid is one of these ligands that I talked about. It will interact with a mineral surface. And then catechol is a very powerful ligand. And it will chelate both silicon and aluminum as well as iron. And so it will very strongly react with the mineral surface. In anaerobic systems, it works a little bit differently. In anaerobic systems, you can't cleave the ring in the same way. We and in anaerobic systems, benzene tends to be more stable. 
and I've seen some plumes described where benzene has gone out 500 meters or more, and all the toluene and everything else is being degraded within 100 meters. Because you can't go from benzene. You have to go from benzoic acid. So I'll use here, toluene is my model hydrocarbon, oxidized to benzoic acid with iron. And then from here, the microorganism can produce this catechol-like substance, a catecholate or dihydroxybenzoate. It can't be degraded, though. It can't cleave the ring. So this can build up to higher concentrations because it can't be used as readily. And this is something that we've been able to uh, find in the aquifer, um, in the groundwater at this site. This interacts very strongly with minerals. This can't be degraded, but this can. The benzoic acid is eventually reduced to a cyclohexanoic uh, acid uh, something or other, and then eventually cleaved and forming CO2. Completely different pathway, completely different enzymes. Benzene doesn't go through that very easily. Toluene does. At the Bemidji site, even though benzene is being degraded, toluene is being degraded much more rapidly. But it, the microorganism can produce a lot of this material. This is one example of a siderophore, a kind of a compound that will grab iron. Now, so we would predict up till now that uh, the pH should be going down. We're producing all this great acid, right? Uh, CO2, organic acids, et cetera. And in fact, the pH does decrease underneath the oil. And we get a plume of pH, if you will, that extends significantly beyond the uh, plume of, of uh, DOC. And in fact, you can map the plume quite effectively just by looking at pH. It's also, of course, a plume of bicarbonate. We're producing a lot of bicarbonate here. We're also producing calcium and magnesium, and we have a plume of both of these constituents. Now, the oil itself doesn't have any calcium and magnesium or none to speak of. This is a byproduct of reaction with the mineralogy, carbonate minerals dissolving, producing dissolved calcium and magnesium. And so we also get plumes of these two constituents, and in fact, specific conductance will effectively map this particular plume. So what's our initial hypothesis? Microbes are eating oil producing acidity and bicarbonate. The acidity is reacting with carbonate minerals, producing dissolved calcium and magnesium. Well, calcite should probably dissolve faster than, than dolomite, based on kinetic uh, arguments. And we can come up with a, an initial uh, chemical reaction that might describe this process. Well, let's see if it actually works. Does this hypothesis make any sense? Let's just look at calcium and magnesium along that same flow path and see if it, if it follows a carbonate geochemistry sort of line. Same uh, diagram. Now I've mapped out the anoxic and oxic portions. Concentration is now in millimole per liter, just to confuse you. Uh, and we have uh, dissolved magnesium in the orange and dissolved calcium. Now in that aerobic part, up gradient, both calcium and magnesium are both increasing. Well, you know, calcium seems to be going up a little faster than magnesium. Maybe we're actually right and kinetics is, is meaningful. But it seems like both of them are dissolving, both calcite and dolomite. If we go a little bit further down gradient, there's this little spike of calcium and magnesium, and that may be where we're introducing more oxygen. We've exited out from under the oil, and we might be producing some more acid, a little bit more reaction. If we go even further down gradient, well, I don't actually think this is chemistry going on here. I just think we haven't nailed the flow path. It's a long distance to try and go to nail a single flow path. So I think we're just looking at advection, dispersion, and we're sort of off the trend a little bit. The problem is, is what's happening here in the middle? It doesn't seem to want to follow our hypothesis. If we just look at these two constituents, just calcium and magnesium, in that first part, calcium seems to be more or less steady state and magnesium increases and then decreases